uh, yes, so this is the final campaign while I am the GDSC lead. And uh, in this campaign, this campaign runs from 18th April to 30th May. So it started one week ago, but don't worry, there's plenty of time. And it's a self-paced campaign, which means we will be studying at our own pace. We will get some courses, we'll get some videos, and we will be following those at our own pace. And we will be conducting study jams for you where we will be discussing what we have studied and also if you have any problems or you need any help understanding then we will be there to help you i will give you an introduction of the team that's there uh, behind the scenes for ml in gdsc iast first there's me i'm sanjana chakravarti i'm the lead of gdsc iast uh, next you have you see in the chat abhirup mukherjee he has also done a lot of ml work you have uh, Abhirup and I are from third year CST. Uh, there's Gaurav Sarkar from third year IT. There's Pornobrita, third year CST. There's Anubhav Sen, second year electronics. And uh, there's Shanandita Das, third year IT. And I think that is the entire team. If I remember anyone else, I will introduce on the group. A uh, quick question, is there anyone here who is not part of the WhatsApp group? Silence, I'm going to assume that all of you are part of the WhatsApp group, great. So any and all information will be sent there. We also have a channel on the Discord. I hope you're part of the Discord. But if not, uh, Abhiru, can you link the Discord in the chat? So in case anyone's not part of the Discord, then they can join it. Great. Now, today's session is going to be an introduction to machine learning. So first, I want to survey how many of you have heard of machine learning or how many of you have never heard of machine learning? Just tell me in the chat once. Have you heard of machine learning? Do you have no idea about machine learning? Is this the first time you're hearing of it? Uh, OK, so most of you have heard of it. Oh, Debankan has also done a bit of it. That's nice. Basic idea. Oh, Jyoti, you were at DevFest. How was DevFest? It's nice. Yeah, I couldn't join this time. Great. So most of you have heard of machine learning. So let's get into this. I will be sharing my screen. Uh, question as usual, is this visible? Is the text visible? OK. Right, let's get started. Um, first question, where in our daily life in technology have you seen machine learning being used? I, I want you to come up with examples. Uh, get some Google search uses machine learning. Yes, that's good. Any other examples from your daily life? Spam filters, yes. Email spam filters. Uh, YouTube recommendations, yes. Spotify algorithms. Image recognition, autonomous driving. Face recognition, yes. Uh, image verification. Maybe you mean image classification. Uh, yes. Or maybe face recognition, yes. Ads, very good. Ads uses, I mean, I think most of machine learning is used in ads these days. Translation, yes, that's a great example. <laughs> Jarvis. Recognition, optical recognition, yes. So a lot of you have a lot a good idea of where we use machine learning in daily life, which means that 
you should be knowing that machine learning is a very, very important domain right now. Um, almost every, every industry uses machine learning and we're finding new applications almost every day. We are coming up with new algorithms, new ways of applying them. So it is a very important domain. It is a big thing in tech right now. And I'm glad that 66 of you are here to learn about it with me today. So let's get started with this video that tells you about machine learning. But before that, uh, I want to give an introduction of what is machine learning. Before that, I'll have to say, what is learning? And why do you think machines can't do it? Learning is the process of generalizing through information. So it's something that humans do, right? You get data and you learn from that data. Suppose, um, yeah, take, there's a hot pan, okay? There's a hot pan cooking on the stove and you're a little kid, you don't know anything and you go and touch the pan. So immediately what happens is you burn your hand and this experience, teaches you that you do not touch pans while they're you know cooking on the stove so that is learning you have learned it now everything that we know right now suppose uh, we know how to count one two three four we know how to identify numbers we know how to identify alphabets we know how to read and this is all a product of learning we went to school we were taught these things and we learned them how were they taught to us? We were shown, you know, this is A, A is for Apple. And we were shown the same picture a hundred times over until we actually learned, okay, this is A, A is for Apple. This is the sound it makes. And so when you do that with a machine, when a machine learns, that is machine learning. And the process is very similar to how humans learn. It is, uh, you keep showing the machine examples and the machine learns from those examples. It, gen it derives a pattern. It understands some meaning behind those examples. And based on these data points, based on the data, it learns to make predictions. So let's look at this short video once. Our ability to learn and get better at tasks through experience is part of being human. When we're born, we know almost nothing and can do almost nothing for ourselves. But soon, we're learning and becoming more capable every day. But did you know that computers can do the same? Machine learning brings together statistics and computer science to enable computers to learn how to do a given task without being programmed to do so. Just as your brain uses experience to improve at a task, so can computers. Say you need a computer that can tell the difference between a picture of a dog and a picture of a cat. You could begin by feeding it images and telling it, this one's a dog, that one's a cat. A computer program to learn will seek statistical patterns within the data that will enable it to recognize a cat or a dog in the future. It might figure out on its own that cats have shorter noses and that dogs come in a larger variety of sizes and then represent that information numerically, organizing it in space. But crucially, it's the computer, not the programmer, that identifies those patterns and establishes the algorithm by which future data will be sorted. One example of a simple yet highly effective algorithm is to find the optimal line separating cats from dogs. When the computer sees a new picture, it checks which side of the line it falls on and then says either cat or dog. But of course, there can be mistakes. The more data the computer receives, the more finely tuned its algorithm becomes and the more accurate it can be in its predictions. Machine learning is already widely applied. It's the technology behind facial recognition, text and speech recognition, spam filters on your inbox, online shopping or viewing recommendations, credit card fraud detection and so much more. At the University of Oxford, machine learning researchers are combining statistics and computer science to build algorithms that can solve more complex problems more efficiently, using less computing power. From medical diagnoses to social media, the potential of machine learning to transform our world is truly mind-blowing.
Right. So a very important part of this video, we learned about the cat and dog uh, identification. How does a machine understand what's a cat and what's a dog? So we show the machine pictures of the dog and the cat, and it learns what it looks like. And we don't tell it how to learn. So like this video said, that maybe the machine figures out that cats have shorter noses. Uh, maybe they, the machine learns that dogs have various sizes. Now, we don't tell the machine these things. The machine draws these conclusions by itself through the examples, through the data. And that is what is important about machine learning. Another very important thing is this graph that we saw. Uh, when we have, we are making a plot of the data points, cat and dog, then there has to be a boundary between them. And this side of the boundary is cat and that side of the boundary is dog. And machine learning, the problem statement of machine learning is simply finding this boundary. Because once you have the boundary, your problem is solved you know, uh, you just have to plot your data on this graph, and then you have to see on which side of the boundary it lies. So this is this graph that you see. This is actually a, one of the machine learning algorithms, and we will be talking more about that later on. So let's see. Now, uh, do all of you have the crowdsource app downloaded. I remember I said you had to install the crowdsource app. So uh, in the chat box, just say anyone who has not installed the crowdsource app. Uh, do you need some time to install? If yes, then we can wait for some time. But I think all of you have the app. Right. So uh, one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to go to the Crowdsource app and click on your profile picture. And OK, three people thumbs down. If you have not installed, please do so now. OK, not available for iOS. Yes, the online version should also work. Uh, that should be fine. Don't worry about that. So crowdsource.app. Yeah. yeah. So I want you to click on your profile picture in the app. And I want you to go on crowdsource settings. Profile picture to settings. And then I want you to go to invite code. And I'm going to give you a code which I want you to apply. That's a DB6F4D. Now, I want you to give me a thumbs up if you have applied this code. Right. Abhirup, uh, open the app. Go to your, click on your profile picture that's at the top. And then you go to crowdsource settings. And then you click on invite code. And I have pinned the code that you need to enter. So what this will allow you to do is you're going to be part of the GDSC IIST community. And we are going to be making crowdsource con contributions together. Now, I will be telling you more about crowdsource later on. But 
right now let's look at a practical a real life application of machine learning uh, check out the smart camera button uh, do you see that smart camera button it's the green camera now if you click on it you'll have to download a 6MB smart camera. It's the model for object recognition. And what happens is, okay, yes. So this is a, if you point it at an object, any object, it's going to identify it. So I'm pointing it at my bottle and it asks me, is this water bottle? I don't know if you can see it, but yeah, is this water bottle? It's made the correct prediction. And this is also an example of machine learning. Uh, does anyone want me to pause for a bit while they try this out? Or is, this, is it fine if we move on? Just uh, tell me in the chat box. Uh, yes to what, Anjana? Do you want me to pause for some time? Okay, one minute. Right. So uh, you can play around with the smart camera. There's many different activities. I will be telling you more about CrowdSource in a bit. You can't find smart camera. Hmm. When you open the app, does it not show you this screen. Do you see the screen? Vinay, Diptanu. Okay. Now, the green camera here is smart camera. Uh, do you not see that? Okay, so Diptanu doesn't have smart cam. Uh, that's all right. Maybe uh, your version of the app doesn't have it, but um, it's not really a very, yeah, there are other options, but you don't worry too much about it. It's only one of the activities that you can do. So uh, let's move on. Oh, you're using the web version. Yes. Uh, so when you're using web version, the web version doesn't really have access to your camera. So it, it, it's not able to uh, use the smart camera option. When you're using a mobile phone, then you can use your camera to actually detect the objects around you. Yes, if you're using web version, then you won't be finding this. So let's move on. So how do you think this game is recognizing the objects do you have like any ideas based on what i've told you so far like what do you think the developers had to do to create this <laughs> abhirup it's giving abhirup wrong predictions yes uh, that's a very good uh, re this is a good time to tell you that machine learning models can get things wrong. They're not always right. So a lot of you are giving me the right answer. There are, it has seen a lot of similar images, thousands of similar images. So what you're basically telling me is this model, the smart camera has been trained. It's been trained on data. It has been fed with a lot of data and based on this data, and it's been told that, okay, this is the picture of a water bottle and this is a water bottle. And when it's been trained, it knows the answer to the pictures of the data that it's been fed. And later when it's making predictions, it doesn't know the label. It doesn't know that it's a water bottle, but it's going to, you know, predict that it's a water bottle. Uh, no, Diptonu, it's not uh, very important for you to have the uh, mobile version. Web version is fine. Uh, don't worry about it. This is just uh, an engagement activity so everyone can have something to discuss. 
about machine learning. So <laughs> don't worry. Keyboard as a building, can you see how or why it does that? I mean, I can totally see a keyboard as a building. It's believable. So, um, but how does it distinguish between the data points? Like when you show it a picture of a bottle, how does it know it's a bottle versus when you show a picture of a phone, how does it know it's a mobile phone? Um, any ideas? Based on shapes, that is one of, that is a good idea, yes. So what information, what is the data we are feeding the model? We are feeding images, right? What are the images made up of? The images are made up of pixels. And OK, so we're uh, getting into some advanced territory here. So let's move on to the next example. Basically, when we are curvy parts of objects, yes, uh, it's related to the shape patterns, pixels, yes. Right, so it sees the pixels and based on the patterns among the pixels, it decides what object it is. So the pattern between the pixels, maybe uh, you see a straight line of pixels and you think, okay, this is a line. Maybe you see a box and you think, okay, this is a book. So. Yes, shapes is actually a very good answer for this. Let's look at the next example. Let's look at another game. And don't worry, you don't need crowdsource for this one. This is on the browser. Let's go to, I'll just type it here. Quick draw. And this is actually really fun. So I'm going to share my experience here. So, you know, recognizing pictures is one thing, but recognizing doodles, um, doodles made by people, and you know, people can be, you know, mistaken. We can make wrong stuff. We are not very good at drawing. So that's even more challenging, right? So let's see what the machine learning model does. Draw a microphone. So I see rainbow. Sees a or rainbow, circle, circle spoon. I'm not sure what that is. Oh, dang. Oh, I know. It's microphone. So it understood that it's a microphone after making a variety of guesses. So there must have been something I did at the end which made it decide that, oh, it's I see a rainbow. microphone. Or boomerang. Oh, I know. It's fish. Let's see. Passport. I see elbow, four foot, four suitcase, four postcard, four book. I see van. Oh, I know. It's past four. Okay, I have no idea how to draw this. I see male, four person, four giraffe. Oh, I know. It's animal migration. Huh, how did know? <laughs> I see volcano. Or mountain, or wishbone, or crowd. I see campfire. I'm not sure what that is. I see leaf. Oh, I know. It's fireplace. Again, okay, I'm going to intentionally uh, do a bad drawing. So let's see. I see ocean, or squiggle, or sweater, or cloud. I see tiger, or crocodile, or ceiling fan, or bear. So thoroughly confusing the model. Or blackberry, or grapes. Sorry, I couldn't guess it. <laughs> so the last one was my fault. It wasn't the fault of the model. And we shouldn't be uh, training the model in such a bad way, because every time you draw, uh, your drawing is actually used as an example for further training. So this cookie that I just drew is going to be used as an example to train this model to recognize cookies in the future. So I have done, uh, essentially, I have done a very bad thing 
by tricking the model. But I wanted to show you an example that the model is essentially it's guessing. It doesn't really know the answer. And, um, you know, it can it can be wrong and it depends on how well the user is drawing. It depends on me, whether I'm doing a good job or not. And if we click on this, then it tells me why it thought that it could have been a blackberry or a corgi or grapes. It's trying to tell me that, OK, it was similar to my drawing in this way. Otherwise, let's look at something we got right. So again, correct match is fish is the closest one. We can see why, because these two drawings were extremely similar. And the important part here is that the machine learning model makes predictions based on how confident it is that it is one thing and not the other things. So even though it knows that you know, this is a microphone. There's always the possibility that it could have been a toothbrush or it could have been a tennis racket. But uh, our model is more confident that it's a microphone and less confident that it's a toothbrush. And that's why the model said it's a microphone. So let's get back to the slides. And uh, while I was playing this game, did you also try it out? Did any of you try it out? Tell me in the chat. All right. H how was the experience? Did you have fun? Hey, right. it's, it's fun because uh, you're making these random drawings and the machine learning model is predicting them like predicting them better than humans would have. I mean, I would have taken more time to guess some of those things. Cooler and table fan. <laughs> to be fair, I don't even know what a cooler is, what a cooler looks like. <laughs> yeah, so you're going to have a lot of fun experiences if you play around with this game. Uh, you'll see that it makes some fun predictions. So how do you think uh, this game works? And how do you think it's different from the previous one? So both of these games were image recognition, right? But what made this one different? Pattern. Uh, you could elaborate on that if you like. What, what do you mean by pattern? Based upon the shapes, right? But the last game was also based upon the shapes. OK, uh, let me give you a hint. The difference is not based on how it's, uh, how the algorithm works, no. Predicting at each step that that is true, but yes, so we were drawing our drawing was in process when you're showing an object to the camera, the camera can see the entire object. But when we're drawing, the model only sees, you know, a little bit at a time. Average shape. OK, I'll tell you the difference that I thought of. Uh, it's great. You could think of so many differences. And maybe some of these are pretty solid. So let me talk about the difference I saw. That uh, this is much easier to trick. This is easier to fool. Uh, yes, how we are drawing the object. So the training of the model is dependent on the user. If, uh, if a thousand users using this model decide to do a bad job of training, then what's going to happen is the computer, the model is going to have a bad job of learning. So imagine if um, everyone all over the world came to an agreement that, you know, this shape 
this shape, we know of it as a circle, but no, we're going to call it a square. And imagine if 75% uh, of the world agreed that it's a square, then the model will also have to be 75% confident that this is a square and not a circle. But um, when we are playing the other game, then see, it's all already been trained on the data that's been given at some point. And okay, this data is also crowd contribution. Um, people submitted pictures of their phones and they said this is a phone and that's how the model knows it's a phone. But uh, there's much less chances of that data being wrong. Whereas versus me drawing that cookie, in all fairness, I could have thought that, okay, I'm doing a pretty good job. This is what a cookie looks like. But, um, you know, you just can't blame me for doing a bad job of drawing because everyone has different drawing capabilities. So that was an interesting point of difference that I thought was between the two models. So with this point of difference, one problem that can arise is, as I mentioned, if uh, users do a bad job of drawing and those drawings are going to be used for training. So in which case, our, we'll do a bad job of training, the model will do a bad job of recognizing. Now, let's talk about how does it recognize the drawings? This is also applicable to the previous game. How does it recognize? Now, a lot of you told me shapes, uh, images, pixels. Uh, some One of you knows a little bit more about machine learning. They said dimensions. Uh, yes, let me introduce one term to you, features. Now, can anyone tell me what features are in machine learning? Some of you said dimensions, so I'm sure some of you know what features are. So anyone? <coughs> Common sense. That's great. If you can talk about dimensions from common sense, that's really great because you're already thinking of it in a graph, uh, linear algebra way. Uh, okay, seems like no one really has an answer for what is features. So let me just tell you, features are variables. Variables which distinguish one example from another. So suppose we're talking about, um, yeah, say we're talking about this bottle. And suppose um, I want a model that predicts whether, you know, given the shape of a bottle, it should predict whether it contains 100 milliliters of water or one liter of water or two liters of water. I wanted to predict that. So how do I know how these different classifications, 100 milliliter, half liter, one liter, how are these different from each other? So we look at the features. Features would be weight. Uh, after you fill the water bottle, what's the weight? I've chosen a bad example because weight itself, weight alone should give you the answer. But uh, let humor me, imagine weight alone does not give you the answer. But um, features that will distinguish the classes from one another. Suppose you're identifying between different species of flowers. Uh, suppose different fruits. Yes, that's a good example. Suppose you're identifying different fruits. Now you look at features like color. Uh, an apple is red and orange is orange. All oranges are mostly orange, apples are mostly red. Shape is another feature, weight can be a feature, uh, length of the leaves can be a feature. So when we are having this, uh, you know, when I'm, I'll get into image recognition because features in image recognition are essentially the pixels. 
and you can see why because the pixels are exactly the information that differentiates the examples from one another if there is any difference you will find that difference all that information is found in the pixels so in case of images pixels are features but suppose uh, we can also approach this in a different way so uh yeah let's look at the data for this game that we just played if you go here now you see that this is the database for this game this is where we have all the examples of the words and there's one representative picture of them here let's look at cat if you click here, these are all drawings that people have made. People like me uh, who just played the game. People like you, people like me. These are drawings we made when we were asked to draw a cat. And based on these drawings, some of these are so cute. <laughs> based on these drawings, the model learns how to you know, recognize a cat or recognize the doodle of a cat. So um, okay, let's get back here. Suppose when you're recognizing a cat, how would you go about it? What are the features? Maybe you'll say a cat has whiskers, a cat has two ears, a cat has a small mouth, things like that. So those are features. Now let's talk about how machine learning is different from your regular computer lab programming. Uh, I suppose uh, many of you have experience with programming already. And uh, with computer lab programming, suppose a C programming lab, it's actually rule-based programming. So you give your computer a set of instructions. It follows an algorithm. And it fo it's like following a recipe. You go uh, from step one to step two, step three, step four. You just execute instructions one after the other. And that is what happens with rule-based programming. Uh, suppose if I were to implement this model, uh, once you recognize cats as rule-based programming, how would I do it? So I would say if number of years equal to two, then uh, go ahead with cat. Uh, if it has claws, sharp claws, go ahead with cat. So I, I'll have a bunch of if statements, a bunch of if else conditions. And basically, computers work in binary. So we'll work with zeros and ones, true and false, uh, yes or no. And based on this binary output, we're going to proceed with the logic in our code. And this is what classical programming is. It's rule-based. Uh, whereas I just told you, machine learning is not exactly rule-based. Because we saw in that video, uh, the machine learning model could guess that the cats have shorter noses. How did it guess that? We never told the program. We don't say if the size is small, then it's a cat. The, the machine learns it automatically. Size is small, so it's a cat. But we don't tell the machine that. So it's not a rule, it's an inference. So when it comes to machine learning models, in rule-based, we define the rules before we write the code. We write the code with the rules already in them. But when we just write the code for an ML model, then a, an untrained model is useless. It cannot, it knows nothing. It has no idea at all. So what you have to do next is train the model on data. And that is the main difference between a machine learning approach versus classical approach. So all the rules that I talked about, uh, size, number of years, claws, whiskers, these are things that the machine learning model will learn on its own while it's training. And it's not a rule that you have to specify beforehand. 
now let's um, have a short quiz so um i want you to tell me in the chat whether the following scenarios are classical programming which is rule based approach versus if it is machine learning so let's see if you've understood this <coughs> first example is alphabetizing a list of song titles so you have a list of songs and you have to reorder them in the alphabetical order rule based approach that is correct this was pretty easy let's move ahead ranking web search results what do you think this is shangomitra says ml ml we have one rule most of you say ml this is google abhirup says it's both but a okay uh, google's algorithm Yes, Google does use a lot of complicated algorithms. Uh, Abhirup, you are disqualified because I know you already have access to the slides. But yes, it is both. <coughs> so something like a web search result, it's very complicated. It uses both. So there are rules. Uh, there are rules such as it checks the document distance. How close is uh, you know the search result to the search item and there are ways to check this uh, in classical methods as well maybe you can look for substrings maybe you can match the longest substring and see if there's a match or not or you can match the occurrences how how frequently is a term occurring in the search result versus <coughs> you can also use machine learning um how useful is this result you cannot you cannot set up rules to tell me whether this result is useful or not you don't know if the user found what they're searching for so in that case you need to train on the user feedback you need to know whether this search result was what the user was searching for and for that you'll need machine learning algorithms let's move on to the next one Predicting housing prices based on location. Um, emphasis on the word predicting. This should be a very big clue. Oh, some of Shankar has an idea of supervised learning. That's amazing. Right. Uh, all of you got that right. That's machine learning. Processing online payments. What do you think this would be? Rule based. That's right. Yeah, you're right. Classifying an object in a photo. We just did this. Yep, that's Emma. Wait, uh, just give me one moment. Sorry, my cat was sitting on the window. So to summarize, rule-based approach versus machine learning. Uh, rule-based approach, the rules are defined when you're coding. But machine learning models learn the pattern from the data that you provide. It learns from training. Now, rule-based approach cannot be changed. So the behavior is same every time you run the program unless you make changes to the program. Whereas a machine learning model can change its behavior with time. So over time, with more, with more training, of, um, maybe with better data, apologies, with more training over time, your machine learning model may change its behavior. It may give you different answers for the same situation. <coughs> If you run the same program again and again, uh, we have actually tried to do this. Uh, suppose you have a bug in your code. There's an error, and you don't know how to solve that error. So you run the code again, hoping that the error is going to magically vanish. That won't happen with rule-based programming. But with machine learning, 
you can it is possible that you run the same program over and over again and get different behavior <laughs> and of course each has its own benefits uh can you give me an example of how machine learning is better than rule based approach can you give me a reason why we would prefer ml over rule based rule based approaches <coughs> flexible lesser code yes dynamic Yes, that is the perfect word, actually. So like I said, you don't have to worry about teaching the machine. The machine learns by itself. So one thing, uh, when you learn about neural networks, you'll see that a neural network is a black box, meaning we don't know what's going on inside the neural network. We just know the input and we know the output. So that's very convenient when we don't know how to solve a problem. and um, of course this is this also leads to some problems in the case where we hope that machine learning can solve every problem even if we don't actually know whether that problem is even solvable or not and of course if it's not a solvable problem then even a neural network cannot solve it but it's very difficult to understand whether a problem is actually solvable by machine learning or not well more on that later now, uh, can you give me an example, uh, a reason why rule-based approach is better than machine learning in certain cases? Like, how would you prefer rule-based approach uh, versus machine learning? Higher precision. Oh, I think you mean reliability, accuracy. Mm, yes, that could be a point. If if you can make accurate, uh, if you can get accurate results with rule based approach, then why would you go for machine learning when machine learning can actually make errors? Because machine learning will be predicting. Doesn't require huge amounts of data. That that is true. Yes. So one of the biggest problems when you are working with machine learning is data you need a lot of data and you need good data so this data needs to be balanced it needs to be clean it needs to be organized and it's not easy to come across this large amount of organized data and another very big yes a faster a very big point here is you don't have to spend time training when you're using a rule-based approach versus when you're using machine learning, you'll see that there are models which have trained over days. It takes days to train some models to learn. And sometimes you just don't have that much time. And if rule-based approach, you can just solve the problem instantly, then why would you waste days of training and resources? Uh, machine learning uses a lot of data a lot of resources, you need a GPU, you need a lot of time. Why would you use so many resources if you can solve the problem without using them? Yes, and the data affects the quality of the models. Uh, very important. Uh, when you're working with ML, you need to be very careful about the data because the data trains the model. The data is the model. So if your data is not perfect if your data is not careful enough suppose you have introduced bias into your data suppose you have inaccurate data and in such situation you cannot blame the model for learning wrong you can't blame the model for doing a bad job because that blame is on you for collecting bad data and that is difficult it's difficult to make sure that you know so much of data millions of data points you have to make sure that they're all accurate, they're clean, they don't introduce bias. And as humans, we are biased. So it is more, even more difficult to actually identify problems in our data. Now, how do you implement machine learning models? Um, right. So first step is framing the problem 
uh, you need to know what exactly you're solving. So I have had people come up to me and ask me, I want to make a machine learning model. I want to train it, but uh, I don't know what to train it on or what the output is supposed to be. Uh, very important, when you are working with machine learning, you should know, first thing you should know is what is your input, what is your output. Even before you know the input, you should be knowing the output, at least the output. Then once you know what output you need and what input you need, uh, what kind of data you need, uh, make a hypothesis um, exactly which features give you an idea of this problem statement. What features will help you make a decision? And this is also one of uh, the most complicated parts of machine learning because the computer sees patterns that we don't because we make mistakes, we overlook. Our brains are not, you know, we're not meant to process so much data. So we cannot find the patterns that a computer does. And because of this problem, it is very difficult to know if a computer will see the same things as we do when we look at data. It will not. A computer looks at data in a different way than humans will look at it. And <clears throat> so the next thing you have to do is feature selection. You have to know which features will help your problem statement, which features will help you make a decision. After that, you need to collect the data. So you need millions of data points. You need a lot of data to train a model. Uh, depending on the complexity of the problem, depending on the complexity of the algorithm, uh, sometimes you'll need millions of data points. If you're working with neural networks, you'll need a lot of data. So collecting the data and making sure that the data is clean, making sure the data is balanced, the data represents the problem accurately, there is no bias in the data and uh, there is no inaccuracy in the data. So if your data is wrong, your machine learning model will be trained wrong. Then the next step is testing the hypothesis. So you have to test uh, the data and see whether the assumptions that you made, whether those assumptions were accurate or not. Then you analyze the results, you plot the results, you see if there's been, how much error has there been in the predictions and can your model do better? And once you've analyzed the results, you reach a conclusion of how well your model is performing or whether it's not performing that well. Do you need to make changes in your data? Do you need to make changes in the training? Do you need to make changes in the algorithm, in the meta parameters? any of those things uh, and then after that the next step refine and do it all over again so it is a constant process it is an iterative process of training a machine learning model it's not a one-time thing that you know finishes the whole job it is something that you have to keep on doing repeatedly to get better results so let's take a look at this, re this video is really nice. So I want to show you this video about bias. Let's look at that. Let's play a game. Close your eyes and picture a shoe. Okay, did anyone picture this? This? How about this? We may not even know why, but each of us is biased toward one shoe over the others. Now imagine that you're trying to teach a computer to recognize a shoe. You may end up exposing it to your own bias. That's how bias happens in machine learning. But first, what is machine learning? Well, it's used in a lot of technology we use today. Machine learning helps us get from place to place, gives us suggestions, translates stuff, even understands what you say to it. How does it work? With traditional programming, people hand code the solution to a problem step by step. With machine learning, computers learn the solution by finding patterns in data. So it's easy to think there's no human bias in that. But just because something is based on data doesn't automatically make it neutral. Even with good intentions, it's impossible to separate ourselves from our own human biases. So our human biases become part of the technology we create in many different ways. There's interaction bias. Like this recent game, 
where people were asked to draw shoes for the computer. Most people drew ones like this. So as more people interacted with the game, the computer didn't even recognize these. Latent bias. For example, if you were training a computer on what a physicist looks like, and you're using pictures of past physicists, your algorithm will end up with a latent bias, skewing towards men. And selection bias. Say you're training a model to recognize faces. Whether you grab images from the internet or your own photo library, are you making sure to select photos that represent everyone? Since some of our most advanced products use machine learning, we've been working to prevent that technology from perpetuating negative human bias. From tackling offensive or clearly misleading information from appearing at the top of your search results page, to adding a feedback tool on the search bar so people can flag hateful or inappropriate autocomplete suggestions. It's a complex issue and there's no magic bullet, but it starts with all of us being aware of it so we can all be part of the conversation because technology should work for everyone. Um, was the audio okay for everyone? All right. So um, emphasis on the last statement in this video. It's cracking. Oh, it's now okay? Okay. So the last statement in this video that I really like is technology is for everyone. So when we're actually working with technology, we're engineers, we're building technology. We need to make sure we keep this in mind that our technology should be for everyone. Uh, there's another video that is very important. It also falls under ethics and AI. So again, I want you to be aware of these things early on when you're just learning about machine learning. So you can address these problems and you can think about these problems when you're working with ML in the future as well. Machine learning systems require lots of data to make successful predictions. What happens when that data is sensitive, such as people's names, credit card numbers, or medical histories? Sometimes, sensitive data is needed to train a model so it can make accurate predictions. But at the same time, this data must be carefully protected. This is the challenge of machine learning privacy. Let's look at an example. Suppose you create a machine learning model to diagnose illnesses based on a person's symptoms. Someone who reports a stuffy nose and a cough might receive the diagnosis, the common cold. Whereas someone else with the same symptoms plus a high fever might be diagnosed with the flu. Plenty of other factors might influence the diagnosis too. Does the patient have a medical history of similar symptoms? Did she recently travel to another country or spend time on a farm with livestock? Are other family members or roommates sick at the same time? To train this model, you could feed it information about thousands of people and their symptoms, medical records, and demographic information. This data includes plenty of personal information that needs to be kept private. In addition, the data sets involved might contain other private information not directly relevant to medical diagnosis, such as patient contact information or the credit card numbers used to pay healthcare providers. What steps should you take to protect user privacy? Step one is to gather and select only the data that your ML system needs to achieve its goal. The less private data you have in the first place, the less you need to protect. This might seem like common sense, but it takes effort. It's easier to copy a whole database than to spend hours removing the parts that you don't need. Step two is to identify any data in your data sets that may be sensitive. For example, people's names, addresses, telephone numbers, email addresses, government ID numbers, and other personally identifiable information, or PII, should be kept private. Another type of private information is user-generated content, such as email messages, YouTube videos, blog posts, and any other content created by known individuals. Be sure to work with your product counsel to determine which types of information are considered private and how to handle them. You also need to make sure you have permission to use the data 
and whether the data has other privacy restrictions. Be sure to work with your product counsel here as well. Step three is to protect the private data. You can do this by controlling access to the data and your ML model, or by altering the data so it's not recognizable anymore, or both. Privacy is a critical concern in machine learning. When you maintain privacy, you build trust with users and protect your company's interests. So I remember we had the Women in Tech Project Sprint uh, earlier this year. And one of the projects, they had an idea to implement something. And we had the idea review session where the mentors, we came and we reviewed the ideas and we talked about how feasible or how impressive they are. And one of the first questions I asked was this data that you are using for this project. Where is this data stored? Who has access to this data? And is there, you know, privacy? Have you thought of any privacy methods, anything to protect the privacy of the owners of the data? Are you making that data non-identifiable? Is it non-traceable? So uh, they had not thought of these things uh, when I pointed it out. But these are one of the first things that you think of when you're working in a big company, uh, especially in a big data company like Google. So data privacy is important. Protecting people is important. Let's move on to the different types of machine learning. Um, we, this is just small examples, and I'll just be giving you an idea of how many types of machine learning there could be. So the first one is classification. We saw an example of that um, when we saw classification between cat and dog. So as you can see in this graph, you plot the data points and you have a line going through them, uh, the boundary, decision boundary, and anything, any data point on this side of the boundary is one classification. Any data point on that side of the boundary is another classification. So this is supervised learning. And if you open the crowdsource app, you'll see that you use classification in the smart camera used it. You use it in image label verification, uh, whether the label has, whether the classification has been correct or not. You have, you see it in sentiment evaluation. What can be the different classification labels, whether happy, sad, angry, sarcastic, things like that. Another example, regression. So regression is the type of machine learning which gives you a numerical output. So classification gives you an output of labels. Which label is this? Uh, whereas <laughs> regression gives you an output of how much. So an example of regression would be predicting the housing prices of a place, maybe a few years into the future. Uh, so what you will do is you see the data of the housing prices of this area over the past maybe 15 years. And then you project that and you say, OK, in the next, you know, maybe five years from now, I predict that this is going to be the price of the house. And that is regression because you are actually giving a numerical output and not just uh, zeros and ones, not just yes or no. The next example is clustering this is a slightly more complicated thing to envision but it's actually you can think of it as uh yes continuous data for regression yes uh Vinif was saying so it's not di discrete it's not discrete values you get a numerical value at the end clustering is well clustering if you think of it in simple terms it's not that difficult to think of when you don't think of machine learning. So, oh, some of you know about the algorithms. Uh, Shubhranil says KNN, K nearest labors. Uh, that's actually uh, not really clustering. Is it Obhirup is KNN clustering? Because KNN is a classification algorithm. Clustering would be K means. Yes, KNN is not clustering. K means is clustering. 
yes, it's very easy to get confused between these two, but uh, A for effort. Uh, I'm glad you know these names already, but uh, you learn more about them later on as well. So clustering is you're given data points. And the question here is, how similar are these data points to one another? And based on that information, you cluster the data points. Like, okay, this is one group, and that is another group, and this is another group. So <coughs> you make clusters of the data, and that's what clustering would be. And it says semantic similarity is an example for clustering in the uh, in the crowdsource app. Now, I do not have semantic sequencing, uh, semantic similarity. It's not there on my app, so I don't really know what they're talking about. Next is sequence prediction. It's uh, a model that predicts what you're going to do next. So some of you, when I asked you about examples of machine learning, you told me uh, recommendations, Netflix recommendations. What are you, what movie are you going to watch next? Uh, then when you're typing, like this is very common. Our keyboards have predictors. We predict what we're going to type next. And uh, that is also sequence prediction. The model makes a prediction of what you're going to type next. Glide typing as well, yes. So, right. So the crowdsource app has some of these to test uh, the sequence prediction model. You can check that out. The next type is style transfer. So style transfer is when you train on a particular item and then apply the training on a completely different item. So an example here is uh, art, neural art style transfer. Uh, so you see you have two paintings and you can you know create a mashup of the two. You just uh, imagine uh, if the great wave of Kanagawa was painted by Vincent van Gogh. So that actually never happened, but with machine learning, you can imagine like, what if this had happened, then this is what it would look like. Uh, another example here is, suppose you have a piece of text spoken by a Japanese man uh, in Japanese, then you have the piece of text spoken by a woman in English, then can you apply the training and create a piece of audio that is spoken by a man in English. Like, can you combine the two in some way? So this is style transfer. Now we're going to play another small quiz. Um, so quickly, recommending next word based on what we've typed so far. What do you think this is? <coughs> Which of these options? Sequence prediction, yes. That's correct. Labeling email as spam or not spam. Which one is this? Uh, some of you say clustering. It's actually classification. Yes or no, discrete. Identifying trends amongst a group of people who have bought a new music release. What would this be? Clustering, sequence prediction, a lot more clustering. Some people saying sequence prediction. It's actually clustering. So you see, there isn't really a sequence. Like, I'm not asking you what's the next song they're going to buy. I am not asking you to predict or recommend songs, but it's identifying trends. The question is a little ambiguous. They haven't really specified what the trends are. But yes, it is actually clustering because you can actually group the different people into different clusters and um, ident like you know make generalizations based on those groups. A bot that reads the news and the voices of famous actors. 
Now, I, I like the abbreviations you're making, SPST. <laughs> yes, uh, style transfer, absolutely correct. Determining workout activity based on phone movement. What would this be? Sequence prediction. I actually don't know this answer, so let's check. No, it's classification. Do they have an explanation for that? I don't know. Let me check. Uh, no, they don't have an explanation, but I'm not really sure uh, why it's classification, but maybe it's because Maybe you have different labels. Yes, walking, running, uh, jumping. So different labels, and you just uh, classify which one it's going to be, which label. Identifying famous landmarks in a photo. Let's see. Uh, classification. Can't be regression because it's identifying. Uh, remember, regression gives you a value, a numerical value, continuous value. Yes, it is classification, correct? Suggesting spelling corrections. This one is interesting. Sequence prediction. A lot of you are saying sequence prediction. One of you says clustering. It's actually clustering. And how are these clusters made? So sequence prediction, uh, you, you are actually predicting what's coming next. You're not really predicting where the word lies. How is this clustering? Suppose one cluster to be a word say the word is, uh, you know, test. Okay, this is your word. This is the cluster. The original word is test. Now, suppose someone has made a typo and they've typed T-E-D-T. Suppose someone's typed text. These are all part of the same cluster because you meant to type test. Yes, clusters of the most common typos for that particular word. So you're making that cluster and you're grouping it as the same word and you're making the suggestion based on that. That's how it's clustering. Predicting the quality score for an advertisement. Now, this one should be. Yeah, that's right. You got that. Clusters of the most common mistakes. Now, predicting quality, quality score for an advertisement. I think this is the last one. But this one should be um, easy-ish if you keep one thing in mind. I know I told you a lot of things today, but that's right. It is regression because you're actually getting a numerical value as your output. And uh, they've forgotten to animate this, so you've already got the answer. But estimating arrival time, again, numerical answer. and. Did I accidentally know they forgot to animate it? Never mind. Yes, it is also regression. They forgot to animate this as well. Translating between two languages, we saw in the examples back then, it's sequence prediction. Uh, how exactly it's sequence prediction, I am not very sure, but if I find out, I'll let you know. So let, we've reached a checkpoint. Uh, what is machine learning? We've discussed that. So far, we've talked about the difference between machine learning versus classical programming. We've talked about how to implement machine learning models. We have not talked about AI versus ML versus deep learning, but I'll tell you the difference very briefly. AI is any technology that appears to be smart. ML is technology that, you know, um, goes through the process of learning. And deep learning is simply machine learning that uses neural networks. And you will be learning about neural networks tomorrow. So uh, 
is that clear AI versus ML versus deep learning? ML versus deep learning is easy enough. Uh, neural networks versus without neural networks. But AI is a little, it, it, they're blurry lines and these terms are a little confusing. We mostly, sometimes we just uh, use these terms interchangeably. Are we going to have the sessions daily? Okay, so not daily. Tomorrow we are having neural networks because it was supposed to be a part of today's session, but then we decided to postpone that. And um, also I realized that we have our exams coming up and all of you will be a little busy with studying. So it won't be daily, but we will try to keep maybe once a week, except for the weeks when we have exams. Departmental orientations, right. Are you from electronics, uh, sorry, electrical? Because I know electrical has their freshers tomorrow. Today was actually CST freshers. Oh, IT, uh, I wasn't aware of that. Early in the morning, okay, thank God. Th that's a weird timing, but good job electrical. Doesn't clash with us. Right, IT, um, actually the guy who's going to take the session on neural networks is also from IT, so I I'll talk to him once and see what can be done. And finally, we discussed types of uh, ML. Uh, well, clubs will always have coinciding sessions. I'm afraid we cannot um, avoid that. There's a lot of clubs on the campus and a lot of the sessions that we conduct are going to be colliding with some of them. Right. So now, uh, are there any questions over here? If if you have any questions, you can type in the Q&A. AI versus ML. So you can see in the speaker notes here. Sorry, not here. So AI is any technology that appears to be smart and it it doesn't need to be actually smart but ml is technology that actually utilizes the process of learning now it's not necessary that all ai systems will learn but all ml systems are automatically ai so i'll show you this venn diagram which is yeah, right here. So you see machine learning is a subset of AI and deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Oh, if it's possible, maybe you can join on the way, maybe from your phones. But uh, we'll check the timing. Maybe we can keep it at like 7 p.m. or something so you can have... Uh, some time to get back home. Any example of AI? Let's see if they've provided an example of AI in the speaker notes. All right. So anything from program software to deep learning models which mimic human intelligence. So there are classical programs, uh, you know, rule-based programs, which also fall as AI. So suppose I remember I made one like that. Uh, I made a Sudoku solver, which does not use backtracking. So <coughs> the reason <laughs> Google Assistant, yes, yes, actually, that's a good example of AI. Um, so I made a Sudoku solver which doesn't use backtracking, but it uses the same rules that humans use. So the same approach as humans. So that would be AI. But yes, of course, these terms are very fuzzy. A lot of them are interchangeably used. A lot of the times AI and ML are interchangeably used. So don't worry too much about that. Uh, let's talk a bit about crowdsource. <coughs> so if you've been paying attention, you will know that uh, I have said this multiple times, data is ML. 
data is what makes ML. And the process of collecting this data is very difficult. It's very difficult for one person to do it alone. I, I'd say it's impossible for one person to do alone. So oftentimes, we have a whole team of people working to create this data. Or maybe we gather this data from passive sources. Crowdsource is an initiative by Google, which allows you to contribute to Google technologies by training their models, helping them train their models. So it's like all of us, we come together and we try to make technology more inclusive. We try to make technology more accurate. And that's how you can play your part in the machine learning revolution. So you've seen the crowdsource app. You've seen, you. Uh, if you've used my invite code, you will see that you will have joined the GDSCI AST community. And any contributions you make will be reflected as our contributions as a community in general and there will be some i think some prizes for top community contributors so uh you can it's not just about the prizes but it's also about making ml more accessible making ml more fair more uh you know making ml for everyone and playing a part in this ML revolution that's taking place and uh, making a difference in the training and creating a positive impact. So I would encourage you to use the crowdsource app and make contributions. And, you know, it's also fun because uh, at the end of the day, it's also a gamified system and you get points and you get levels. So uh, sometimes when I have nothing to do, I use crowdsource. And, being productive, I tell myself. So let's talk about the campaign again. So there are two tracks. Uh, this is the beginner track. Keep in mind when you're filling the form for the feedback today, you will have to say that you have participated in the beginner track. Beginner track has intro to ML and neural networks. Neural networks will be taken tomorrow. <coughs> and after that, we are not going to be covering the intermediate track but everything that is discussed in the intermediate track we will be referencing in our beginner track material actually <clears throat> some of the stuff in today's session were actually also from the intermediate track so don't worry there is uh, no lack of content you will not be missing out on any information we will make sure that we convey everything to you and I will be sharing these slides with you, but like I told you, it's a self-paced learning campaign, which means you will have to be learning at your own pace. You will have to be following the courses by yourself. And these are the courses. These courses are on Kaggle. We will be holding sessions for the Kaggle courses as well, where we'll be discussing some of the topics in the Kaggle courses, but you will mostly be following these courses alone by yourself <clears throat> and the links are here in this uh, ppt in this slide uh, you have intro to machine learning uh, you'll get you'll get redirected to a kaggle page it has a three hour long course and right so i'll be sharing these slides with you don't worry about that and that marks the end of the presentation and there is a survey which you will have to fill out. I will paste the link in the chat box. It is very important that you fill the survey because filling the survey is what will, you know, mark your attendance in this campaign. It tells Google that you have been a part of this campaign and you are learning in this campaign. So uh, make sure you fill this uh, form. It's very important. I will be sharing the slides with you. <coughs> and if there are any questions, I will be available for exactly three more minutes because I have another meeting after this. Uh, I'm sharing the slides here. I'll be sharing the slides on WhatsApp as well. Someone has a question. Is, this, is it possible to solve 
CP problem using machine learning. <laughs> right. Um, is it? Um, when you're thinking about whether a problem can be solved using machine learning, I told you, uh, use that approach. First, think about the output. What's your output here? Um, is it code? Level is beginner. Oh, level in crowdsource. Uh, you open your crowdsource app and you'll see uh, if you go to my crowdsource achievements, right? So uh, you open your crowdsource app over here and you'll see this button here that says achievements. Um, sorry. Yeah, achievements. Uh, you click on this. And sorry. Yeah, you click on that and you'll see your level like I'm level seven. So that's what you have to enter. So enter zero. Uh, that's fine. This is just a survey. And that's just Google wants to know how many new users there are versus how many people have been already using crowdsource. uh zero isn't an option in the form wait let me just um then you can click on i'm not a crowdsource user or you can click on level one if you like i don't think it makes much of a difference level one is really small so yeah you can either click on i'm not a crowdsource user or click on level one name of the institution is Indian Institute of Engineering Science and Technology Shipwood. So, yeah. All right. So, yeah. Either I'm not a crowdsource user or I actually have another meeting right now, so I will have to hop off. But if you have any questions, uh Yes, you are actually, uh, this session is under GDSC IAEST. So you are participating in this campaign as IAEST. So yes, that is the college that you will be filling. Uh, thank you for attending this session and thank you for staying till the end. And um, tomorrow, hopefully, if everything works out, we'll be having the neural network session. And in case it doesn't, then we'll let you know in the WhatsApp group. Don't worry about that. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask us in the WhatsApp group. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And have a nice day. Bye.